And I just want to be able to show up in the way that I used to be able to show up. Menopause. Why aren't we talking about this? I'm on a mission that no woman should suffer in silence. I'm on a mission to increase awareness and create a community. I'm on a mission to make this M word mainstream. I'm on the menopause mission. When I first came to see you, I found myself in bed for two days crying relentlessly and really not wanting to go on. And it was my daughter who came and sat on the bed and said, Mommy, do I need to call someone? And that's when I knew I needed to call someone. Mm -hmm. So I called you. Yeah. And I was with a friend. And she essentially just guided me in and said, I know he can help. So what do you remember about that side of the story for you when I reached out to you? I remember that phone call coming in and of, I just remember there was almost like a, like a desperation on your part of like, you, there was an obvious need that something was going on that was big and it was, you know, you maybe didn't know where to turn to or what to do, but you're just kind of willing to try anything at that point, it seemed like. And so, um, yeah, we just kind of set up a, an appointment to get started and to take a full intake and find out what was going on with you. And you were on some supplements that your friend had given you as well. And um, we kind of reviewed through, like, that might be helpful, but that might also not have the right mix. Depending on where your hormones are, it might not, not be the best choice, mm -hmm. too. Totally. Um, and there's so much out there. Yeah. There's so much out there. So many choose. options. So at the time, I had a, an idea from a medical doctor that I was perimenopausal, mm -hmm. menopausal. Um, now I know definitely that I'm postmenopausal, but you can't know that until retrospect. And the only indicator for me was a blood measurement of my FSH. Yeah. level. So we knew that was high yeah. and that was something that was going on with me. But I felt completely out of control. I felt like I had no idea what was happening to my body. And sure there were hot flashes, but there was so many other things. Mm -hmm. And first and foremost is my mental real breakdown. I, yeah. I, I didn't want to go on anymore. I didn't feel like life was worth living yeah. if it was going to be living like that. So do you, you must see a lot of women that come to you in this state and there's, and it's so confusing. Yeah. Cause you know what, Jesse, perimenopause, I think this can start four to seven years before menopause actually starts. So we see people where they just, they know something's different, but their hormones maybe aren't changing. And like with you having FSH changed or uh, uh, being tested for, FSH doesn't always change. It doesn't always go up. Mm. So it's very, it's variable. And some women, it will start going up sooner than others. And so they can be in perimenopause without FSH rising and not know it. So then they're not getting any answers there either. So. It was nice at least you knew that uh, at least coming I had in. that yeah I can't even imagine not knowing whatsoever what was going on like you feel like you're losing your mind your life yeah. is like a runaway train out of control and something's happening but you just you don't know what mm -hmm. and with sleep going off circadian rhythm starts changing and you think about what estrogen has an effect on so like the interesting thing is like progesterone typically you've got these two hormones right like progesterone estrogen these ones need to be balanced out for a healthy cycle mm -hmm. and the first thing we'll start seeing is progesterone starts dropping in perimenopause and then estrogen will start going down but it first has like a peak and then goes down mm -hmm. so it's this little wild ride um, which accounts for why so many women go through these symptoms and they don't all get the same symptoms as well. But 
with circadian rhythm being um, sent off and um, the, the mental aspect of it where there's um, emotional changes and mood changes, there's estrogen receptors on your brain. And so as your estrogen drops, the brain is screaming out for help. Like it doesn't mm. have the same hormones like, you know, dopamine and serotonin, the, the feel good hormones and some of the other ones are they're They're not being made as much. And so it's, it's kind of like, imagine coming off of a antidepressant, like mm. that quick mm -hmm. drop in hormones. That's what you experienced. Yeah. When you talk about the brain screaming, uh, that, that feels that just resonates that resonates that feels it feels like my brain has been screaming for two years and it 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 just doesn't stop screaming and so this has been an exploration of modalities that can help with some of that mm -hmm. so it's interesting you talked about the estrogen peak because when I came to see you one of the first things that we did is we did a Dutch test, which was a thorough, significant hormone test. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe exactly what is Dutch testing? Yeah, so dried urine testing uh, for comprehensive hormones, that's what Dutch stands for. And it's a private lab that runs it out of uh, the States. And so we have access to those labs where we can get a very full picture of the hormones and what they're doing. So. It doesn't just tell us a little snapshot in time. We actually get a four-point curve over the whole um, the whole day, and so then we can see, you know, you make three types of estrogen, and so we want to see all three types and what amounts you make of each one. It shows your detoxification pathways of estrogen because a lot of people will hold on to estrogens, and so this shows how you actually let go of them and detox them after you're done using them, or not. <laughs> And then it looks at even some of the genetics around your detox. So your ability to methylate, which is detoxification, adaptation, um, making new DNA. And so if that's not working, estrogen's also not getting out through there. Then we look at progesterone. There's two metabolites there, testosterone and other couple types that we're looking at. So we can tell if there's, um, if there's enough testosterone, but also it's kind of like, I, I compare it to perfume, where, you know, if you have the, like, the nice eau de parfum that's like, you need one spritz and that's strong enough. Right. Versus like a weaker perfume, you need lots of spritzes. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's all over the place Axe to actually body smell. spray. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so it's kind of the same thing with these two testosterones. The one is, is so much stronger and potent that you need very little of it to actually get the effects of it and feel things like libido is actually there or muscle strength and mass and energy. Huh. So um, it tells us that. And then it looks at your adrenal hormones. So cortisol is the big one here um, that is responsible for your energy levels and stress levels. Is, and with cortisol, we can see this over the whole day. So in the morning, it should start rising, peaking mid-morning, and then coming down in the afternoon, evening. And so with yours, Jesse, if mm -hmm. you remember, when we tested your adrenals because of the, the lifestyle you live and how busy you are, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, your adrenals were making less cortisol than you were using. So this was what was sending you into this, this deep uh, decline in energy and mood and stress and all of that. Mm -hmm. I think the way you would put it is my cortisol had flatlined. Yeah. which some people don't really understand because typically when you talk about being stressed or having a stressed hormone, the cortisol, you think of it being high. Mm -hmm. And I was confused. Mm -hmm. So why was mine low? So over a period of time, when you have high stress, first thing your cortisol does is it, it rises and it helps you to get through that stressful period of time. But because your stress didn't just end after a few weeks, but it kept going on and on, the mm -hmm. adrenal glands just don't have the ability to keep up with that same level without replenishing them on the other side. Mm -hmm. And so that replenishment can look like many things. Like it, it can be quiet activities, meditation, yoga, walking in nature, grounding, um, or there's supplementation that can help that too. But um, your, your levels had reached a point where they were no longer keeping up. You couldn't make the same amount of cortisol you needed and we ran into that deficiency. So 
we we term that one like adrenal fatigue or exhaustion also known point. as burnout burnout exactly mm -hmm. so what was also interesting about my test at that time is that my estrogen was high if i re recall correctly it was high relative to progesterone yeah okay and so that's where this we saw like we talked about progesterone had already started dropping mm -hmm. Um, estrogen was lower than it should have been for a regular cycling um, woman, but it was still um, higher than the progesterone. So that was leading to this um, change in hormones and change in um, symptoms, uh, especially around the period. Yeah. So what was interesting is the symptoms that I was experiencing then, and I started to come to see you about a year ago. Yeah. Uh, so are, are quite different now. There are a few that are the same. Mm -hmm. So when I came to see you, I remember feeling a lot of breast tenderness. I remember feeling a lot of uh, some hot flashes and such. And I also remember um, the night sweats. I was experiencing quite a bit of night sweats. Where, and I'm talking where you actually have to wring out your sheets. Mm -hmm. it's, you're, it's almost as though you've jumped in a pool. You wake up and everything is wet, drenched. I have since not experienced breast tenderness, uh, very rarely a hot flash, and uh, significant reduction in night sweats what it's moved into is an increase in the um, mood, mm. in the anger, in the emotional uh, challenges or lack of capacity to handle stress, um, in the drive, in the motivation. And I, I like to say it's so much more up here for me, which makes sense mm -hmm. because I believe what has happened now is that my estrogen has dropped yeah. and that significantly impacts the brain. That's right. Yeah. So now that, you know, we were able to balance out at the time we were helping your estrogen detox more, helping your progesterone to be elevated and, and balance out. Um, and so now as those have had a chance to both kind of go down together into menopause, now the brain is left with a deficiency there, which brings all these new symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so this is where we start looking to different styles of treatment to, to help the brain. Mm -hmm. Reassess. Exactly, constantly reassessing. So, what we did start doing, however, I can say definitely brought me out of the darkness. So we got my Dutch test back, mm -hmm. we assessed the results, you and I met, we talked over everything, and we decided to immediately implement IV therapy. Mm -hmm. So what is IV therapy? So IV therapy or intravenous therapy, it's about bypassing your digestive system and putting nutrients right into the bloodstream so that they can just fall off into the cells where they're needed. And so it requires no extra energy or steps by your body to do that process. And so then you'll absorb up to 100% of it um, mm -hmm. as opposed to depending on your gut, how well you might absorb there. And so for you, what really stood out, Jesse, was the burnout that was there and the, the mental, um, emotional, changes that were happening mm -hmm. that we we started something called NAD therapy mm -hmm. and so NAD is the it's vitamin B3 that we uh, it's activated form which is used by your powerhouses of the cell the mitochondria mm. and so <laughs> <laughs> I remember that from grade school the Everyone mitochondria does. <laughs> yes it's because it was so hard to say and spell that's right yeah <laughs> <laughs> so these are little powerhouses of our cell yeah okay every single cell has up to thousands of them and when you're young you have lots of them but every 20 years or so that decreases by about 50 percent and so as your levels of mitochondria decrease and nad decrease um, throughout your lifetime you're going to start noticing some deficiencies starting to show up compared to where you were before and when you look at a graph of where the levels tend to trend, 
the NAD starts just plummeting at the age of 40. And so you mm -hmm. get that happening alongside the same time as menopause mm -hmm. is starting to come in with estrogen plummeting at around that age too. And you've got this perfect storm that the brain doesn't have the energy it needs for it to function properly. It doesn't have the estrogen that it needs to make those hormones and prompt it. And so that's kind of where I met you. And so NAD, what it does is it will actually repair the mitochondria so that they'll start functioning normally again. It can make help you to make new ones um, and gets the energy pumping out in your body again and in your brain. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was a big one that we did there. Yeah. And what an impact. So I went from, really, I didn't, I didn't want, I didn't want to go on. I didn't, I didn't want to live anymore other than for my little girl. And I didn't want to work anymore. I didn't want my business. I didn't want really anything. To leaving this office a few months later. So I think it was in about three months or so. Um, with a smile on my face and feeling like myself again. Maybe not completely, but she was there. I could see her she again. was there. Oh, and that felt, I mean, that was, that was monumental. That was monumental. So what did we describe what, um, what regime, like what was the schedule that I was on um, when we first started? Yeah, so with this therapy, we always started it with um, a vitamin nutrient bag. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that was so that the NAD could be worked properly. It needs those other vitamins and minerals alongside it. And we did this for four treatments consecutively. And typically we do this like one to two weeks apart. We just try and get them in as quick as possible to try and elevate your levels, bring the NAD up in your body so you can start making um, energy and get those processes going properly. And then after that, we moved into a monthly uh, regime where we were just working at continually replenishing and, and keeping things more stable after that. Yeah, and now we're just in maintenance. Now we're in maintenance. As required. So there are many other things that you offer and an abundance of knowledge that you have as you are a naturopath. So tell me how that came to be. What's your story? Why did you get into this? <laughs> Well, my journey starts at the age of 17, actually. Yeah. And at that point, I was feeling like I should know what I'm doing with the rest of my life, which I know <laughs> is silly now, but I still started looking through the job books and what am I going to become? What, am I, what should I do with my life? And so the only thing I knew was I wanted to work with the mind and the body and the whole person. I didn't want just a little piece of it. I wanted the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I was didn't know what this existed. So I started going towards physiotherapy and I was like, once that's done, then I can maybe add some other things on and we'll figure it out. Um, it wasn't until the end of my, my undergrad that I spoke to a friend and he said, oh, what you want to do is called a naturopath. And so that's where I interviewed one and it was like, it was instant. That I, I knew my calling was to, to do that. Um, and the doors just kind of opened from there, but it's, it's such a rewarding, place to be to to work with people and like I I like to work with people like you Jesse because my goal is to try and empower people it's not about me telling you what to do and you go do it it's about how do we work together as a team to bring about your goals and and get your health on track where it needs to go because as much as I can provide information on it you're the one who has to actually do it you're the one who went out and actually followed the plan and mm -hmm. made it happen so mm -hmm. that's really rewarding yeah I mean I was desperate so I had to you know? <laughs> <laughs> there's not much choice there <laughs> yeah uh, so you knew at, at a very young age and what did your career journey look like? So how did things go from there once you pivoted, if you will? <laughs> so after a, an undergraduate in a, like a science degree, then I went to the naturopathic Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine in Toronto and I did a, a four, d four year doctorate degree there. And so it's you learn all the basic sciences of um, similar to medical school. Um, you learn how to do physical exams and how to diagnose. And then 
um, the treatments that we learn there, instead of being more pharmacology based, we look more naturopathic based. So looking at, um, we learn acupuncture and botanical medicine and nutrition and um, natural health supplements, that kind of style of treating. So um, then after I graduated and started working, that's where I started to move more into intravenous therapies and, and you can kind of build out your profession from there. But yeah, yeah it's a good toolbox to have. No kidding. I saw a flash of light out the window, and uh, and then I, and I thought it maybe was a, a police camera. Oh. And then I heard the thunder, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, Old it's a thunderstorm!" Storm coming. Yeah, I love it. Totally. Um, it's it, we haven't had one yet, so it feels no, we haven't. It's right. This is like it? our first thunderstorm. It's kind of exciting. It is. It's <laughs> like, oh my gosh, flash. Yeah. That was awesome. So, you finished school. Now you're ready to put it into practice, pun intended. Yeah. So how did things go from there? I was, I, it was a dream, honestly. It, the way it all worked out, I didn't know if I would join a practice or start up my own clinic, but um, I had a, a brother who had a space for me <laughs> that we're in here. Oh. And he, um, he had kind of a part of the dream for me. So we were able to make this happen together of building a clinic. And um, <clears throat> from there, the the dream for me became about building it into an integrative practice. So the idea with integrative means you're working alongside other healthcare practitioners. It's so essential that we work with other healthcare professionals and not take on an ego that we know how to do everything because we don't. And so we need that support around us. And so it was, um, we brought on a, a nurse practitioner who sees patients in a similar scope to a family doctor which is kind of a nice adjunct, um, especially when we're talking menopause, because in some parts of Canada, they can prescribe um, hormone replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. In our part, we can't. And so working with a healthcare practitioner like a nurse practitioner who can is really helpful because then there can be some cohesion there with the treatment plan when that's needed. Okay. Um, and then we, uh, we built it out with holistic nutrition and massage therapy and acupuncture and yeah, a few other things, but it's, it's been really, been really rewarding to create a space that is healing for people and have people walk in and feel that and see the difference of like, they, that's the first thing we'll get is people like, it feels so good in here. That's what we're looking for. <laughs> it does. So this is just such a gem. And what's interesting is you're situated in a little town in Alberta and you're at essentially the house on the hill. That's right. Right? Yeah. And so it's almost built into the side of a hill and you can't miss it when you're driving down the main street. And it's just this beautiful, looks like a cottage, if you will. Yeah. And when you walk in, it feels like you're coming home. That's you know? what we wanted. Yeah. Well, you've achieved it, and uh, and what a dream come true. So now you're here working with people to help their dreams come true by empowering them to be their best. So you particularly have an affinity for women's health, mm -hmm. and we're going to address the questions out there, but this is a man, it's a male naturopath, <laughs> and, and not a woman, and what do you know about women's health? And I would say a lot, um, but what is the affinity there for, for working with and helping women? Well, um, I grew up with three sisters, so <laughs> I'm the youngest of the family, so oh. they helped raise me, so I feel like they should take some credit for this, but um, women's health has always been very important to me. My wife is uh, an RN as well, and so she's um, she's brought a lot of it to my attention too, and just even illustrating the deficiencies in the medical community for women's health, that you go and see a doctor um, or different practitioners, and their recommendations are very, um, they're very minimal and they're almost dismissive of the concerns that you bring to them. And if they just do a blood panel, everything's normal. No, nope, you're good. Nothing's wrong. You obviously don't feel that way. So that's not true. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm passionate about bringing out the, the research from women's health that is being done and looking at that and saying, there's a lot here to work with. We can, we can make a good treatment plan for 
for women to feel feel better. Mm. Um, and another part of it that I'm passionate about, of course, as you know, Jesse, is cancer care. And with women who uh, who have high risk of breast cancer or have had breast cancer, some of these treatments are not safe for them to be taking, both natural and hormone replacement therapy is not always the right answer. And so um, being able to dive in and actually help them identify, here's what's safe to use for your concerns, that's really, um, really big for me too. What's interesting when you speak about the research or lack thereof is if you just take a look at a societal timeline and all of the research that was being conducted intensively for longer periods of time have been with males, yes. have been to men and in study of the male anatomy, which suggests, and I'm not a doctor, that there's just not the data yeah. for what women are going through, or, or rather what is going on inside women, mm -hmm because it hasn't been done for yeah. years and years and years. That's right. What do you think is being done in regards to that? Are you seeing advancements in that? We are. We're finally starting to see some more women's studies coming out. Um, in particular, I've been see seeing some coming out of China and some coming out of Iran. Um, some of the almost unexpected places, but there have been more studies coming out with women's health and starting to follow it because um, we're starting to understand the whole menopause picture better. Like there's so many unknowns still of like, why does this happen? Mm -hmm. And this is where, you know, we're, we can start to see, oh, like this is starting to explain, like the NAD portion is starting to explain why circadian rhythm and sleep starts going off because that declines. Mm -hmm. And um, another big one has been about hot flashes. Why do women get hot flashes? Mm -hmm. So we're finally starting to understand and this is so fascinating to me, but it's it's more to do with, so we know that the temperature set point drops with hormones going down. Mm -hmm. And so that's what gets these hot flashes going, but um, it seems to be more related to like endorphins. And, and so not so much like the hormones, like you can give someone estrogen or whatever to treat that, but with say patients with breast cancer, you give them things that stimulate oxytocin and that gets rid of the hot flashes. So as we start understanding this, we can start using more effective treatments to help those symptoms out. Yeah, that's wild. There's, there's so much work that needs to be done. Yeah. And for me, I just felt called to be a catalyst for these conversations because I think that's the beginning yeah. is to say, we need to talk about this more because it's not being mm. talked about enough yes and as we create spaces for these conversations to occur then that becomes the domino effect for things to take place like more research and mm. more money poured into this and it being a priority yes you know what jesse i feel like if we could stop saying that menopause symptoms are just normal i think that would go a long ways because as soon as we start taking that and saying, okay, that's common, but it's not normal. That's not your optimal health to be experiencing those symptoms. Right. Then we start to look at it as something that we can do about it, as opposed to just, oh, just let it go, just leave it be. Just suffer the insufferable that's for right. some women. And yeah. not all women experience the types of symptoms that I've gone through. This has been my lived experience. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that it has been transformative enough that I needed to do something about it knowing that I can't possibly be the only one that was suffering in silence. I can't possibly be the only one that feels like I've lost my life, that I've lost myself. Yeah. And, I, and I will not just let this happen for 10 to 15 to 20 years yeah. because that's not quality of life. No. And I see the same picture play out several times every week. Someone like you, Jesse, walks into my office with similar complaints and they often don't know why because they don't even know that there's something going on with hormones. And so being able to offer some clarity on that um, I think is really important and actually do some testing and find out why they're feeling that way. 
Mm -hmm. Give them answers. It's important. It's so important. What's also important is how much hormones can impact us. And I had, I had no idea. I, and I, I don't think most folks do. Mm -hmm. The power of hormones. But with that also comes this delicate dance that we do with remedies and um, solutions that are available off the shelf and such. So there's a lot of stuff out there for menopause. Um, and I started taking something specifically because I needed to, it was out yeah. of desperation. But what I didn't know is that it was high in estrogen, which may actually serve me where I am now, but was definitely not serving me where I was when I met you. And you mm -hmm. told me immediately stop taking them because mm -hmm. my mom died of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And we know that high levels of estrogen are connected to breast cancer. So that's scary because yeah. there's, there's all of these solutions that are being marketed to us, but we need to be really, really wary mm -hmm. because there's lots of little ingredients that may not be right yeah. for you specifically. That's right. Yeah. So that's where some of these common herbs and even you know, I guess another one that's important to, to think about is, is food sources. Um, mm -hmm. Soy is the big one that we talk about, right? Yeah. And is it safe and should it be utilized? And the, the simple answer is honestly yes. So it, the benefits of that is, you know, when we look at estrogen, if you were to take a estrogen replacement therapy, that is going to do one thing. It's just going to elevate your levels of estrogen. Mm -hmm. You take an herbal support of estrogen. Sometimes they will, uh, they have a weaker bond to the estrogen receptor. Mm -hmm. So that means that they're going to bond, but they're not going to stay there. They will go off. So you'll get a, a, a boost in your estrogen and then that goes away. And that can actually have protective effects against our exogenous sources of estrogen in our environment. Like you know, heated up plastic, for example, that has all the BPAs and different other kinds of, of um, sources of exogenous estrogen. And these will then bind to those hormone receptors and cause um, it to bind really tightly. And then you have worse symptoms from that and mm. that doesn't reverse. So it's important that you have the good ones in there. Um, but also, like you said, knowing the supplement to know does it have the right ones for you? Yes. Um, yeah, that's important. It is important. So if I would have continued on taking something that was off the shelf for menopause that I can access at a health food store, which is probably very, very safe mm -hmm. for a lot of women, that had the possibility of being extremely harmful to me yeah. due to my history and the fact that at that time okay. I was at that surge. Okay. So, because I was at that surge mm -hmm. of high estrogen, I would have just been piling on more estrogen. That's right. And that's why, like, the breast tenderness you talked about, that's one of the big symptoms that shows up with that, that it's yes. higher than your progesterone, and so that throws, throws it off. Um, it might have helped your hot flashes, but that's where this, this dance happens, where you can help some, or some symptoms and then make some worse. And so you don't, you don't know what you're doing until you have the whole picture in front of you. Yeah, you don't. And, and what is beautiful and fascinating is that every woman is different and it is just the scale, right? And it's, you put a little bit here and then you put a little bit there and it just, it's finding that balance for you, which yeah. is different for everyone. That's right. So you talked about the IV therapy and you talked about some of the other modalities that you have here at the office as an integrative clinic. Mm -hmm. What are some other things that you look at with each patient and that you looked at with me? So we started the IV therapy, but there, was, there were a few other things that we talked about. Yeah, so we like to look at some of the lifestyle factors and one of the big ones was stress, right, Jesse? Mm -hmm. And that is something that we have to address the stress as well and one of the big reasons behind this is because of your your adrenal glands 
that make cortisol for dealing with stress, they also make estrogen and progesterone and testosterone. And so when your, um, your cortisol levels start to drop, your estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone are thrown off as well. Mm -hmm. And so if your body's not making estrogen as much as it used to, it's gonna rely on these adrenals more. So if you have high stress, now your body doesn't have the hormones even that it needs to, to, to be helped. And so um, coping with stress, getting some, um, there's different ways to, to do that. So we look at different lifestyle factors, like we talked about meditation, um, proper sleep hygiene um, and eating properly as well so that you're feeding your body with mm -hmm. the foods that it needs to um, be able to cope with those stress sugar we know is very very inflammatory increases those hot flashes mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing and then um, looking at other tests as well can be really helpful so looking at nutrient levels in the body. So there is testing available for that. Where are your B vitamins at? Um, you know, where is your um, mineral levels, magnesium, iodine, things like that, that can um, have a big impact as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then another way that we've treated menopause as well, or it can be supported is with acupuncture. And there's Chinese herbs within that that can be utilized and then the acupuncture itself that um, depending on your symptom picture, it, it, there's a, a, a big support, I guess, for that. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a good thing that we're gonna be talking to an acupuncturist then because oh, awesome. uh, <laughs> my uh, acupuncturist is actually my doula. She helped with the delivery of my baby. And so I'm sure there's going to be some incredible insight and there are so many different modalities. Yeah. Um, hormone replacement therapy is a viable option. Yes. It's something that I'm still considering. It's something that a lot of women consider. There are benefits and there are risks, just like there are with many things to weigh, and yeah. there are multiple people to talk to about that. Hormone replacement therapy is not something that you're able to prescribe, is that correct? That's right, yeah. And that is and that's based on um, the province that you that you see a naturopathic doctor. Yeah. Some provinces have the prescribing rights and abilities and some do not. So that's something that we don't do here. But we do refer patients when there does sometimes reach a point where they're not getting enough support off of just naturopathic treatments and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so we need to refer on and we can also work together at that point. Mm -hmm collaboratively and so there are some great hormone clinics around um, and that's where they will do their own hormone assessment with you some more testing and then they'll put together um, treatments on that and there's differences of using estrogen alone or estrogen and progesterone or testosterone into the mix so um, yeah that's it's a it's an option and I think the important thing with menopause and perimenopause is don't be afraid to constantly reassess, like you said, right? Oh, it changes and your body's changing the whole time. Mm -hmm. So what worked for one point might not continue working the whole time mm -hmm. and that's okay. It's okay to keep looking and finding what's the right fit. I love what you said in regards to working together because ultimately the goal is to empower mm -hmm. the woman to feel good again yes to feel like oneself to feel like they can face the world and bring to the to this universe the gifts that they're meant to yeah that may be a collaborative effort that may be through different modalities like naturopathy and acupuncture and hormone yoga therapy and 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 so there are so many supports out there to explore that can align with um, hormone, uh, what is it, HRT? Yeah, HRT, hormone replacement therapy. Hormone replacement therapy. So there are lots of modalities out there that can align with hormone replacement therapy mm -hmm. that you can be doing as well. So it can be an and and it can be an or. And I think that for me, I'm just on a mission to educate and 
create community and safety for women probably mostly spark hope that you're not alone yes. and there may be something out there that can help you. And uh, Dr. Sheldon is definitely one of those people. Yeah. Thank you. I, uh, you've done so much for me and I'm so grateful. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks for letting me be a part of your journey mm -hmm. too. So it's, um, it's been a, a ride. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, here yeah. we go. <laughs>